I've improved by a whole grade. I've improved, 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 improved by a whole grade, by a whole grade, by a whole grade. My teacher isn't just Mr. Maddock, it's a whole teaching team made up of James, Mike and Marta. My classroom's all about doing and applying. My day standing at the front of the classroom with a PowerPoint are long gone. I master every concept by learning at my own pace. I spend 100% of my class time interacting and supporting individual students. I move on only when the moment is right for me, not the whole class. I know what each and every student is mastering and struggling on at every moment. I know exactly what I need to learn next, and I can go back and review material at any time. I spend my teaching time supporting and inspiring, not planning, delivering and marking. I can learn from anywhere at any time. I can switch off when school closes, knowing they are learning from the best. My teacher has my homework marked before I get to class. I set every piece of homework at the start of the year. I'm two weeks ahead of my expected progress. I can track everyone's progress with a swipe of a finger. I can track my own progress and set my own targets. I now have time to focus on developing the skills of every learner in my classroom. I know exactly what it means to explain, evaluate and analyse and I'm not afraid of any exam. My lessons are now far more about the skills and the application, not just the content itself. I've completely remodelled what it means to be a teacher in my classroom. Today, our teacher in Classroom 21 is James Sims. James is a PE teacher and creator and director of MyPEExam.org and TheEverLearner.com. James, welcome to this week's show. Thanks. And first of all, James, how, how do you find it being on the other side of Classroom 21? Good and bad. I mean, I had a lot less preparation to do for this experience than interviewing Hannah Wilson, for example, last week. So that's kind of nice, um, but bad because I don't know. I don't. I don't. I, I'm not really proud of my uh, physical appearance right now and my sort of state of physical health at the moment. So uh, the focus being on me is a little uncomfortable from that perspective. But you know, that's what it is. Just have to get on with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get on with it then. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to start with an easy one, James, how has the summer been? It's now end of August, we sort of, everyone's sort of getting started, all teachers are going back in September and everyone's going to be asking the same question, how's your summer been? So how's your summer been? <laughs> it's been really nice. Um, we, I, went, I, I drove down with my younger daughter through, through France um, at the start of the summer, just the two of us. Um, we drove all the way down to Spain over the course of two days and uh that was kind of nice it broke the feeling of being at work that was sort of i think that was 23rd of july or something like that and then we had two weeks of the four of us um being on holiday we we, we had a lot of rest we we, we kind of had a, a bit of a nice house in the country in northern spain with a swimming pool little half day travels here and there it was really nice so it really broke the the feeling of being uh repeatedly at work which is which is you know kind of common over, over the last uh, few years and it's probably the time I've switched off most over the course of the last four or five years so that was really nice uh, since coming back it's been quite gradual I mean I haven't I haven't been working sort of the 12 14 hour days I usually do so you know I've been probably working on average between six and eight hours a day um, which feels really light if I'm honest um, so that's been that's been quite nice um, and I, I I feel personally feel quite different to how I felt at the start of the summer so some of that is purely by having a rest and the change of scenery other other parts of that are about sort of the confidence of where we are as a as an organization and, and that what is likely to happen over the next 12 months feels a little bit better than where we were previously so that's made the summer more enjoyable and it's nice as well because probably two years ago it wasn't really possible for me to switch off for a holiday um, but the team we have around now, it's quite possible to achieve that. So, um, yeah, big thanks to pe big thanks to people like Natasha and Mike and yourself as well for enabling that switching off to actually happen, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Um, you, you you're talking about sort of personal switch offs, mm -hmm. sort of you know your, your your own switching off things, but also over the summer, a sort of virtual switch off has happened mm -hmm. because 
mypeexam.org has ceased to exist. It's not working anymore. Why well, it still that... works. We just turned it off. Yes, but why? Why that switch off? What's What's happened? So I think the main idea here is I think what people need to realise is that mypeexam.org, although it's something I'm very proud of, an achievement I'm very proud of to have, to have got that off the ground. You know, people need to re- understand that um, I literally built that from scratch um, on on pennies and buttons and built a business using uh, using that platform as the centerpiece of that business. Um, but ultimately that with the popularity we have and the number of users we have that that platform could not continue indefinitely and certainly couldn't continue in the format that it was that it was in and allow us to develop the breadth and diversity of curriculum offer that we uh, that we want or that we're now currently um, moving towards so that so that was really critical so in terms of our um, in terms of our offering to people, we needed to provide something which was which was uh, uh, built from the ground up i mean I, I don't know how many People watching this will understand how uh, website builds go, and and some sometimes you literally build it from scratch. Other times you use frameworks and plugins that are kind of off the shelf. Um, and we were doing that initially with my PE exam. Um, so we 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 really had to do that. So we spent we spent two years in the in the development phase of what we've replaced it with. Um, and we're extremely excited about that. So. The switch off was kind of strange because I was on holiday, so I didn't. I literally didn't switch the button off on the day. I almost forgot that it was happening, um, but now it feels kind of normal. And my PE exam, I mean, it was serving uh, over a hundred thousand learners a year, which is remarkable. I mean, when I say learn, I'm talking about unique learners learning regularly a year. Um, so it was serving that many people, and it did a great job in that period, but ultimately it was time for us to build something which was more professionally developed, strategically developed, and has the capacity to develop the breadth of curriculum that we want to develop, because it would be easy for me to sit on that, look, I could have sat on that my P exam thing, and I could have made some decent dosh for four or five years, and been a a comfy guy, you know, and done whatever next and been in a good position. But it's not what motivates me. What I want to achieve is some kind of influence or change with or necessary change that I see within the educational cycle and therefore um, building the replacement platform and switching mypexam.org off was an essential part of that process. Mm. And I'm confident that people who make that transition with us will understand that pretty immediately. Mm. Brilliant. We will we will talk about the the everlearner dot com in in uh, yeah shortly, and I will also uh, want to talk to you about your philosophy and and mm-hmm. and what what is behind it all. But but I would I would start. I would like to before we look forward um, onto the present and the future. I, I'd like to us to reminisce a little bit, and and I, I would like. Could you explain to us where where did the idea of my PE exam? I don't need a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, I haven't got any, so you, yeah, you'll have to use your your shirt. Um, so where where did the idea of my PE exam dot org come from? How did it all start? How did it all materialize? Mm. So, I think the main thing to realize there is that I I started recording my teaching um I don't remember the exact year I believe it was 2012 it might have been sort of mid 2012 um and I started recording that teaching and there were a couple of factors that led to it the, the first one was that um I'd been given some devices that I didn't know what to do within my subject I was a head of PE at a big sixth form college so we did a lot of classroom based learning a lot of what you might call academic PE um a lot of coaching and sport as well but it was a dominant classroom experience and I guess the kind of the iPad age was on us at that point, or it'd been, you know, the, the, the sort of reliable tablet age had been in place for two or three years by that point. And tablets were starting to move into education as a device that might influence sort of how learning happens. So uh, a senior colleague of mine uh, passed me some iPads and said, look, what can you do with these in PE, James? I didn't have a clue. So I started, you know, playing with apps and things. And I found like screen recording. The one I used a lot was called Show Me back in the day. Very simplistic finger end, making some videos. Kind of kind of fun, but, um, you know, pretty poor quality, really. We've all been there. Yeah, <laughs> we've all been there. Just to explain everything up and things. I mean, it, it's almost unthinkable for me to go back now and, and and make that kind of resource. But at the time, it was quite revolutionary, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, that, so that was happening. Meanwhile, I, I've been questioning the dominant classroom model for a period of time because year on year, although results, we, we, we had at times like 300 A-level students across uh, 
AS and A2. So big cohorts of A-level P students. So it gives you a really good insight into what works and doesn't work from the head of department perspective. And I started noticing that people who, from my perspective, should be really achieving well were, in my view, underperforming through our dominant model of what I would loosely call a one pace fits all curriculum. You know, we had a, a, a set course, we had a set scheme of work, you know, pretty typical stuff, I think. Um, and I would always be surprised with different individuals that they would seem to underperform in that environment. Now, someone could listen to that and go, well, that's normal. Sometimes kids do underperform. And that's, that's true. But my view was that something structurally wasn't right. And I had one particular experience where uh, we had one young man who had some domestic problems and couldn't really come to college very much. And um, anyway, so he, he basically failed his AS year with us. And at that point, typically, what we would have done is we would have, you know, for want of better words, sidelined that student and they wouldn't have studied day two with us because they had, they, they passed their practical module, but they had a U in their, in, their, in their theory papers. Now, we would have traditionally have said, look, you can't carry on. Um, but in this case, that we had the disclosure that this young man had these domestic issues. So we wanted to support him. Now, those domestic issues continued and that individual couldn't come to college as much as would have been ideal. So at that time of having these iPads and this recording technology and the fact that this young man couldn't come to college, I started, I decided at that point, okay, I want to start recording some of my teaching. And it was ugly, terrible sound quality, but I thought, okay, let's give it a go and see what happens. And that young man redid his, um, he did his AS modules in back in the January reset days. And he did really well. I mean, he didn't get every mark, but he did really well, despite not being in the classroom doing his AS work only having these videos to rely on whatever other resources he was using. And he reported back to us that the thing that made the difference was the videos. Mm -hmm. So that's where it started. And when that happens, like, what do you do in that situation? Do I make a couple more? Do I, you know, do, do, do I, do I stop and that job has been done? And in my case, and I mean, maybe this is something to do with my character. I don't know. I just went into production mode. Um, partly fueled by obsession, partly fueled by there's probably elements of narcissism and being a big show off and wanting to put my teaching out there kind of thing. Um, but I just kept recording and recording and gradually the quality got better and the, and the production got better. And yeah, and it went and, th and that's how it started really. But there was no plan at the start to build a business. That mm -hmm. was not the intention. That was later and almost accidental. So now there is a plan. Yes, there is a plan. And how would you summarize that plan? So around, again, I'm, I'm actually kind of hazy on the dates and the times, but around about 2014, there were, there were a lot of teaching videos available freely online between yeah, 2012 to, up until 2015. And they got used a lot. I mean, we were we were on serious few, you know, we had serious views on YouTube. We had a big subscriber base. Um, and people started using those videos in classrooms. Um, teachers were using them. Students were using them for their in-between lesson learning, for their revision, this kind of thing. So, so that started to happen. So, from there, obviously, the mind cycles and thinks into what could potentially be. And again, at this point, this was not a commercial desire. I started to realize that this kind of repeatable, high-quality. Um, self-paced teaching if you take the resource of teaching and make it self-paced high quality repeatable it could have a really big impact on a student's performance across the cycle of something like a course an a level or a gcse or whatever so i started thinking about how to implement the use of that resource and then it started interacting with my classroom and i i think i remember the eureka moment quite well i was at i'd, I'd actually uh, left the sixth form college at this point partly because my results were going up partly because of the um, the video work and I went and worked in SLT but in a in a local secondary school and I remember doing a, a lesson with my GCSE group at the secondary school and the lesson worked that the students had a whole series of activities they had to do and one of them was to take the teaching which they could do at a moment and a repetition that suited them and by that point I had some basic quizzing on the website so they had to take that quizzing as well. And then they would, for example, go and do a piece of writing or a little practical. But they all did it at different orders and different rhythms. And at that point, I realized that that video technology, its most potent feature 
was that it released the teacher from the necessity to stand at the front of the classroom and teach all students at the same pace, at the same rhythm, all at the same time, at the time decided by the teacher. Now, I hope in my case, I could have done that teaching from the front and it still would have been good quality for the students. You know, I, I broadly know my stuff and, you know, I, I, I think my teaching stands up alongside most. So, it, you know, it was reasonable quality. But we've also got to remember that not every student has that quality in the classroom. I'm sorry if it sounds egotistical, but not every student has a James or a Marta or other great teacher in the classroom. Some, some students don't have that. They Sometimes they have a very inexperienced teacher. They have an, un, an unsure teacher. They have they have a, a teacher who who's long-term ill for example and then of course the potency of this becomes becomes quite relevant so i remember that i remember that moment quite well of that lesson and because the classroom wasn't ready for it, that lesson was actually in the dining hall because it was the only space that facilitated that kind of experience and we so we did it there so that that was an influential moment um the business now is strategic and it's strategically designed to create change in classroom environments. It's not directly strategized to make money, although we have to to survive. It is directed at changing the experience of what it means to be a teacher and a student in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's something I'm really proud of that we keep that ideology at the center of our work. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I mean, you, you, what you were saying about the, how the how the, that particular lesson you were talking about how how it developed and what you realised and and about the you know the reality that not every student has a good teacher in front of them or a good teacher helping them. In this situation, you may have encountered you probably have encountered teachers who appear to be a bit fearful, um, who appear to you know who may suggest that what you're trying to do is to remove the teacher from the cloud of the cloud from a classroom and replace it by a computer screen is this what you're trying to do no uh bluntly no firmly no and with absolute educational philosophical conviction no um we do want to replace one feature of the teacher, what you might call the traditional teacher behavior from the classroom, and that is one pace fits all transmission, delivery of information from the mind of one teacher or supported by whatever, a PowerPoint or a whiteboard teaching or whatever they're doing. We are trying to remove that one pace fits all element of the classroom, but that releases the teacher to perform a whole load and series of other behaviors, which are actually far more challenging for the teacher far more developmental for the teacher and much higher skill level for the teacher. So we are trying to um, limit or, and obviously every individual teacher has to, de has to decide to what degree they're not going to teach from the front anymore. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to release teachers from, if I try and be hyper provocative, from the tyranny of one pace fits all broadcast lecturing. That we are trying to replace. But within that context, trying to free teachers to be available to their learners far more regularly, whether that's small groups, one-to-one, -one, or indeed whole group level, um, that they have more time to interact, to mark, to target set, to listen in a classroom. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I go back to um, Heather Lane's uh, comment to us on one of the recordings that we've done that she spends 90% of her lesson time in one-to-one -one time with students is quite dramatic. So we certainly don't like the idea of replacing the teacher. In fact, look, what we, I guess, a, a summary of what we're trying to do is to take the best features of the internet and smash it together with the best features of the classroom. We don't believe that one of the best features of the classroom is one pace fits all broadcast lectures. You need the lecture from the best lecturer possible, but it should be paced by the student repeatable and available continuously. Mm -hmm. So that's that's ultimately the difference. Mm -hmm. Good, mm -hmm. sounds sounds interesting. Um, in, in, in still on this line, um, in in the secret master plan which you wrote in 2017 last year, you stated that your primary objective was to create a disruptive and revolutionary service that fundamentally challenges the dominant educational model in place right now. Mm -hmm. So this, the, 
you know, it seems good to line, be, that wasn't it? Pro- yeah, it is good. Um, provocation, being disruptive, seems to be a crucial part of, of of what you do. Do you feel you are any closer at the moment to achieving that? Much closer. We we could not do that with my P exam. It was not robust enough. It was we we couldn't have broadened our curriculum there. We we are now in a situation where, in my opinion, we have a hyper effective online service which directly interacts with what a classroom should be and can be so whether you judge that to be features like the assignment setting that we've brought in uh, the fact that we've got practice mode test mode and checkpoint quizzing within that environment uh, for example the quality of the data analytics which is provided for the teacher and student never uh, never uh, written or, or, or structured by them but provided to them those things make a dramatic difference in how a classroom can be achieved mm. so we have immediately made a classroom far 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 more data centric for example without the teacher literally needing to lift a finger mm-hmm. um, so that means that a teacher for this is just one example but a teacher rather than having to produce data can now spend their time responding to data at time that they have in greater quantity because if they choose to, they can do less delivering to whole classes all in one go. Mm-hmm. So we're far closer on that basis. We're also closer because while we've had a lot of success in what you might loosely call academic PE, that across the educational um, uh, framework and across the, the, the educational um sort of canvas is, is a very small portion of the picture. So obviously now we, we have a platform which we can develop into areas like languages, sciences, humanities, mathematics, and so on and so on. Now, once we get that breadth of curriculum, the tendency for teachers to choose a methodology that we're advocating or something equivalent or similar to that is going to increase. And I want to make a really important point here. We do not believe in an idea where we tell people how they should do it. It's more that we provide a service which makes a better model of doing things so obvious and so easy to achieve that you're just going to choose it because it's so clearly better than what we might loosely call the traditional one pace fits all model with some differentiation bolted on. And I'm not knocking differentiation. If a teacher out there is good at differentiation in a classroom, I think that's great. But you have to remember that differentiation is necessary Because the class and the course is one pace fits all. So you have to bolt on differentiation. What we're arguing is the entire experience should be differentiated to the individual. And therefore, intrinsically, the experience is differentiated by direction and pace. Mm -hmm. And and we're much closer to achieving that. Um, There's a couple of big moments coming up when we release, for example, our GCSE science courses. I'd be really intrigued to see how teachers respond to that, how schools respond to that. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden we'll have this series of ideas and potentials in an all-encompassing subject Mm -hmm. like GCC science. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a very interesting moment. Mm -hmm. I would like to spend a little bit, look a little bit, in a bit more detail at at the EverLearn, right? I I can imagine maybe some teachers have been you know like spend the last months of last academic year you know working worried about the GCSEs worried about their levels they didn't really you know they didn't really realize that my PE exam wasn't going to be there in September so there may be some scenes of panic (laughs) next week uh, in the streets of uh, the UK and abroad so for those people who are still not familiar with what the everlearner.com does, let's look at it first from the point of view of the student. Mm. What are the main features that the student is going to benefit from? So I guess the, the real big headlines on that are that the student has access to um, a really high quality teacher via self-paced um, self-paced teaching and self-paced teaching being a resource that they can access online at any time that they need to. So let's say let's say a student is studying, I don't know, GCSE Spanish or GCSE PE or whatever. Um, they can access the, the resource of teaching from a really, really, really high quality teacher who's going to spend 10 minutes explaining the fundamental principles of whatever concept to them at any time and at any repetition. So therefore, the tendency for a student to become stuck is very, very low. 
the tendency for a student to, to be confused ongoing is very, very low. Again, within that environment, once a student has or once the student is experiencing some teaching, they can also they can also make notes alongside that teaching and they can bookmark online notes alongside that teaching. So for example, if, if I'm teaching something in physiology, I'm teaching something about energy systems or equivalent um, on the tutorial, the student can be making online notes and bookmarking that against my teaching so that they can make a note which is um, the aerobic system is blah, blah, whatever. Um, those notes stay bookmarked against that video content permanently for that student. And if the student finds that note later, clicks on that note, it will take them back to that moment of teaching about that specific concept. Furthermore, the student can enter a whole series of uh, practice quizzing in what we call practice mode, where there's no pressure on them. They can go into that practice mode environment, take a whole bunch of really, really, really high quality questions. I mean, I can't tell you the difference between the quizzing experience on, on the Everlearner to my P exam. It's a vastly improved difference, not least because we've made th literally thousands of new images that stimulate those questions in a more visual, analytical, graphically illustrated way. Students take this practice mode. They can take those questions endlessly if they want to. And their notes are there to help them that they've made on that content. So that is a safe place. No one's tracking that. Teachers are not seeing that information. That's just for them. Once they're confident, they're going to test mode, test mode. And test mode basically means they're going to get a whole batch of questions. And the output of their answers is recorded, is aggregated, and reported back to the student and the teacher. There's also time limits on that answering. So the student, again, can go on forever if they want in that test mode. But we are going to be drilling, 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 drilling the core language and key concepts of those tutorials, those lesson areas, those that part of the, of the subject of the specification. And then I was going to say finally, but it's not really finally. We have, um, we have what we call checkpoints. And checkpoints are the closest we have to summative tests. They're kind of end of unit experiences. And students go into those end of unit checkpoint tests. Uh, they can enter them any time. They can repeat them as much as they want. The checkpoint will always be different, but it will always have a set number of questions and a set time frame. And when the student submits their answers, they won't know if they were correct or incorrect until they submit their checkpoint at the end. And then that checkpoint feeds back to them on all of the things that they got right and wrong and why they got them right and wrong. So they have that corrective and directive feedback within, within that environment. Um, so if, if you consider that they have that and they have their classroom at school or college, the chances of student high quality learning and success dramatically increase. So that's the broad experience of the student. So think, put yourself in the mind of a 16 year old or an 18 year old who's about to do their A-levels or their, their BTEC level three or whatever. Um, imagine having that resource available to you. You have in theory a master teacher, you have ongoing quizzing, testing, data, you've got all those things available to you, and you've got your classroom at school, your teacher there to support you. For me, that's how education should be in the modern world, that you have the best of the internet combined with the best of the classroom, and then we see what kind of merges out of those experiences. Mm -hmm. And from the, from the perspective of the teacher, what are the main features they they are going to find that are different from from what they had in my PE um, exam at all so I'll focus on differences in that case so obviously they can access the tutorials themselves they can upskill they can learn from the teacher in this case James or in languages martyr or I won't name our other content creators just yet but um, depending on, on on who that teacher is they can still access that material they can also take the quizzing and all that stuff if they want to do that for themselves a couple of things I would say is they they have a, a feature called assignments uh, an assignment basically means that um, you establish a time window, that time window could be a week, a month, an hour, and you designate for the student that you either have to watch a series of experiences, or you have to test at a certain level, or you have to complete a checkpoint at a certain level, and the student has to achieve whatever that's been set within that time window. So, of course, the student has this self-paced, repeated opportunity to look at things and take experiences whenever they want from the site. But the teaching can say, okay, even though you've got that, I'm telling you that in this week, you have to watch these tutorials, take this test, and you have to complete this checkpoint. 
So that allows the teacher as well to also say, look, we've noticed student X that you're strong in this area, but maybe you're struggling in this area. Here's some resources within this time window to improve on that area. And assignments can be set for individual students, whole groups or small groups of students, whole classes, whatever you prefer. So traditionally, we'd set pretty much the same homework for all learners. And many teachers will do that with the everlearn.com as well. But you can set a task for an individual is specifically relevant to them. Um, so I think the assignments is a really big feature. I think one of the things I'd really draw attention to is uh, is the dashboard feature of the website as well. So as students are engaging with these experiences, including the assignment type activities as well, the dashboard is constantly calculating and updating where the student is at that particular moment. And one of the really strong features of that is what we call the live score. So let's take, um, I don't know, A-level biomechanics in PE. It might have something like 20 videos, 20 lessons, something like that. Every tutorial, every lesson comes for the student with a live score. So let's say one of them is Newton's laws for argument's sake. The student, after they've done a batch of questions in test mode or checkpoint on Newton's laws, carries a live score. Now let's say that I do 12 questions and I get six right and six wrong. My live score as of now is 50%. But if I do another 12, and in the next 12, I score 9 out of 12. My life score moves to 75%. That previous batch is neglected <clears> because <throat> the score is live. It's mm. of now. Okay. Equally, if I do another 12 and I get them all right, and I'm on 100%, and then I don't look at Newton's laws for three weeks, my teacher can set me an assignment to test on Newton's laws, and I have to prove I'm still 100% today. So that makes the tendency for knowledge to go stale and the forgetting cycle to be far reduced. And I think one of the things that all of us as teachers would acknowledge is that we have a tendency to deliver courses. We do it in an order. We don't return to things enough. There's Generally, no time, there? there's no time. Generally speaking, this facility enables the teacher literally without lifting a finger to encourage or even force students to return to material and to uh, to reestablish an understanding, to use the the the, the memories that they've developed, uh, to 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 encode and decode once again of material that they haven't used for a little while. So for me, that dashboard's super important. I mean, I've got, it does all sorts of other tracking as well. And finally, it sounds ever so basic, really, but we just have a brilliant system of notifications. So if I just give an example of this, let's say. Um, I'll give two. Let's say a, a teacher sets an assignment to watch three tutorials to their whole class within two weeks, say. I say I choose two weeks because we do a lot of two-week target setting with students. So let's say that's the case that three tutorials over two weeks, you have to watch these things by 14 days' time. The notifications is going to work that as soon as that assignment is set, those students are going to be emailed and notified on the site through the notifications page. Two days before deadline, the students are going to be emailed and they're going to get a notification on the site. One day before deadline, they're going to get a notification and email. That, for me, is extremely potent because it, it, first of all, means the tendency to not complete is going to be far lower. Bear in mind also that the tracking is uh, live and automatic of what's being done. The teacher can also see who's approaching deadline and who's not. And the student literally has no, let's call it, wriggle room um to choose not to learn so in that environment what's the tendency going to be for that student the tendency is going to be that they're going to learn better than they would without that kind of facility mm -hmm. and then i mean just take into account the fact that the tutorials for example are accessible they're friendly they're warm one of the really nice things i like about the tutorials is that when i was a teacher i had to be numerous things i had to be disciplinary mr sims uh, punctuality Mr. Sims, timekeeper Mr. Sims, inspirer uniform. Mr. Sims, uniform is had to be all those things. And I'm not knocking any of those things. A, a classroom teacher has to do that. Mm. But in the video experience, I don't have to be any of that. All I have to do is be the greatest explainer of these concepts that's ever tried to explain it. Now, okay, that sounds quite elevated, but that's all I have to achieve. So I focus entirely on that and I can make it fun. I don't have to be a uh, higher status teacher with lower status students. No, we've got teacher and learner. We're on the same level. I can even tell a joke or two. I can I can refer to myself as James. I don't have to be Mr. Sims in that environment. It's a much more it's a it's a much friendlier environment. And the tutorials, the way I want the students to feel is I want them to feel like they've got 
the greatest teacher on earth, that material sitting on their shoulder, <clears throat> whispering in their ear appropriately. Um, sounded a bit weird there for a second. Um, we want we want that feeling of almost like having the one to one tutor available to you constantly. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we'd all recognise some like one to one tuition. If we could afford it, it would be great, right? Like you might lose some social processes, but um, we can afford it now. And it's achievable now. It's not mm -hmm. what it used to be in terms of, you know, having the personal tutor. But the output is extremely similar. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I mean, still on this line, when you, when you, when you set off to, to build the everlearner.com, the, the site, you, you wrote also on the secret master plan that you wanted to create a beautiful environment for mm -hmm. learners and teachers. Yeah. And from what you say, you seem to feel that that's what you've achieved. Aesthetics are important, despite my horrendous physical health right now. I mean, right beautiful now. can be aesthetic or yeah, yeah. otherwise. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it depends on how, obviously, how you define beauty. I mean, I'll, I'll look mm -hmm. at it from the aesthetic perspective, first of all. I mean, the website is done properly. It, it We've really thought about whether it's um, the aesthetics, the branding, the feel. Everything there has been calculated and, and thought through. And I'm extremely proud of that. So from that perspective, again, the, the difference from IP exam is so dramatic that it's almost incomparable. Um, secondly, it's beautiful in the sense of the feeling you have. I mean, I'll just refer back to what I said before. The tutorials, they're not necessarily aesthetically beautiful. Though yours are pretty good. I have to say you're good at drawing. For mine, I've got kind of scrawny handwriting, not great. And sometimes not a very good drawer, for example. But that stuff doesn't matter because... What I do in the tutorials is I, I hopefully at least create a beautiful experience where the student is with somebody who wants to be with them, who wants to passionately explain these ideas to the student because they believe in those ideas. I remember sometimes I have to really fight going off on tangents. Like sometimes, especially on the biological stuff that we do. So I quite enjoy my science. So like that, the, I... I you know, I sometimes talk about capillary. So I've got some favorite feet. I'm a big fan of a mitochondrion, for example. Um, and I sometimes have to hold myself back. But on the positive side, I, I hold myself back because of the level of the qualification, say. Um, but the student can feel it. And this, uh, so it's a beautiful experience in that sense. Like, this guy wants to tell me this thing. This guy wants me to learn this thing. So there's that side of it. There's true passion in in those tutorials and of course you can do that in the classroom as well and many many teachers do achieve that but for me i have to find that energy and that passion for 10 minute windows is difficult that is different from when you're teaching six hours a day for example you're more likely to achieve it so uh, it's beautiful in that in that sense and it's beautiful in the way that the logic has been set up the live score is a good example okay test mode sounds a little bit threatening but it's a lot less threatening where you think, right, well, if I do 12 questions wrong, study for 10 minutes, do 12 more, and I get 12 correct, I've got 100%. We're literally, it's beautiful in the sense that we are streamlining what we believe are learning behaviors, producing things like regularity, consistent, consistency, note-taking skills, completion. These behaviors have been developed without anyone having to do anything. And that that kind of behavior is also beautiful because if you if you if you develop those kind of learning behaviors in young people i mean they're going to succeed let's be honest and, and finally i must make one other point of what i i guess is beautiful the website also complete and, and us philosophically also completely rejects the idea of um let's call it learner ability or, or default learner ability some kind of you know smart kid dumb kid scenario okay we reject that notion altogether and we reject it because we can so we literally know today that there is no correlation between how fast someone learns something and how much they can learn okay those things do not correlate so someone that takes something a bit slower can still learn at very very high levels now there is some evidence to suggest that if you go to like genius einstein level maybe only some people can touch that okay but when i talk about that we're talking about gcsep here right that's not you know what I mean? So what we find, well, what I personally find beautiful is that we say to students, look, you can get to the highest levels of achievement and we're going to push you until you get to that highest level of achievement. And you know what? It doesn't matter how long you take. It doesn't matter if you have to repeat things. It doesn't matter if you have to take 
direction different to somebody else. Do, take that different direction. Take that different pace and rhythm. But for goodness sake, never accept anything which is below that standard. If someone tells you as a student that, well, you know, your target grade is a C, listen to it, understand that person, empathize with maybe that teacher who's telling you that, but never, ever inside accept that you are a C, well, a, a, a four grade student. I can't use the one word I want to use. I'll say, screw that. That Reject that. And teachers need to reject it too. Now, of course, when we come to report, I understand there's cycles we have to work in, reporting data. Uh, projecting, I get it, that's the that's circumstance we work in. Remember, we have a far more data-centric environment that we're offering than you would have without it. So mm -hmm. you've got that data to actually be more reliable. But for goodness sake, please accept from me that your students can, and please don't set them arbitrary limitations like C greatness, or here's your target grade. Or if you do work with target grades, don't let them be impinging on the self-perception of any individual learner because trust me, they can do it. And I find that a really beautiful thing as well. It's very it's very enabling. It's potentially very democratizing for people. So, so, so is, is one of your core values in a way to obliterate that idea of ability, of innate ability? I can only, I guess I, I can only answer that in myself. Look, I'm not qualified to say that IQ is not real, that people are not, I, I'm not going to sit here and say people are not born with different synaptic connections and all this kind of stuff and maybe different overall potential. Okay, maybe that, maybe that to some degree it, it, that's the case. I've seen little to no evidence that it impacts on learner performance at the age of 16 to 18. I've seen massive amounts of anecdotal and also research-based evidence that learning behaviors are the things that impact on that regularity, completion, concentration. These things truly make a difference. So why would I focus and build something on the basis of something that I can't control, like smartness or ability? I can't control, I can't touch that, I can't control it. And I also, and again, leaning on the work of Dweck and Sal Khan and these guys on this one, but I think it's far more potent to see the mind like a muscle than it is like a computer, you know, a computer which has limited technology and space and whatever. For me personally, I'm, I find it much more facilitating to think of the, 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 um, the mind like a muscle. And therefore, if you exercise it, if you strain it to the right degree, if you work it, if you challenge it, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's the model that I work in and that's the model I want to work in. It goes very, very deep with me. Because otherwise, we come up with this talent model and, oh, how surprising. That talent seems to always emerge in groups of people that it emerged in before, whether it's to do with wealth or class or race or gender. We have this model where this talent, this smartness, this IQness, this abilityness, it kind of comes out more in certain groups of society. And that's, I reject that idea because for me, education should be a true vehicle of social mobility, not of social reproduction. Mm -hmm. And therefore, or societal reproduction, I should say. So for me, that unwavering belief that every single student who sits in front of me can achieve at that level it goes so deep in me that you probably see it it goes really deep in me and i can't i can't conceive of anything else but that now if i read something that's reliable and proves i'm wrong i'll i'll tailor my view to that new learning but right now i see no reason to mm -hmm. Good, great. Um, my to finish with, I'd like to ask you. So obviously, your sort of technological offering has changed. To call it, to give it a, a, a word, it has changed a lot over the last four or five years. Personally, on a personal level, have you changed much in those four or five years? Interesting question. I'm going to answer that. I'd be okay on the camera. Uh, what do you mean? This camera, we okay in this one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Have I changed? Yes. Um, when I when I finished as a teacher, or when I did my last, I don't want to say finished as a teacher because I, I would like to get back into schools at some point. I would be, I would find it difficult right now. But um, 
I was nowhere near as determined as I am now. Um, I was I was much more risk averse uh, previously. Although I still was a relative risk taker, I think generally speaking, against the average. But um, I've changed in the sense that um, I believe that I can achieve things, and I'm willing to take whatever steps necessary to achieve them. I think I was far more going with the flow as a as a, a younger man. I mean, as a teacher, as James that was in 2014 or. 2012 or whatever. Um, I've probably, you know, on the negative side, I've probably become work obsessed, which I don't advocate at all. I realise it's a weakness of mine. Um, th there have been times in the last five years where I've been literally willing to sacrifice anything to achieve the outcome that I want to achieve. I'm not saying that's positive. I realise there's there's negativity to that. Um, but equally, there's a there's a steeliness to that, which means that it's more likely that the outcome will uh, will take place. I've realised that uh, I I have a much higher capacity for work than I thought I did when I was. I I remember thinking when I was a younger person, I was a lazy person. <sighs> I I can't. Maybe you were. I mean, maybe if you, I was. If you thought of that when you were a teenager. It's uh, yeah, but <laughs> it's um, quite, I think we all were. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but but but. I mean, it's kind of funny now, really, you know, that the amount of commitment that goes into things. Um, I think I'd much better say that I hadn't found what it was that drove me or, or that, that inspired me. So um, that changed me. Physically, I'm not the same person I was. I'm probably four stone, three stone, four stone heavier than I was before. I'm really ashamed of it, if I'm honest. Um, something I need to do something about and, and get balanced with. So, you know. I hope sometime, maybe six months' time, we'll be sitting on equipment recording this and I might look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, I, but I still consider myself a teacher and I still consider myself to be that same teacher I was before, mm -hmm. the same um, desire to explain things to people, to inspire people, that sort of thing. So that, I think, is consistent. And if you look ahead, if you look five years ahead, five years from now, what do you hope will be different and what do you hope will stay the same? For me personally? Mm -hmm. uh, I think for me personally, I'd like to have a more balanced um, relationship with work. Uh, I think people generally are working really, really hard at the moment. I think in my case, it's slightly different. I'm not I'm not doing that. I'm not doing those hours because there's kind of a, a compulsion to do it or a cultural expectation to do it. Uh, but it's more like a self-driven um, feeling. So I'd like to find balance with that. Uh, 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 including in, in the coming year. Um, I'd like to have a voice at a whole school, whole college, whole system level with regard to what is an optimized classroom in what would it be, 2023? I mean, I, I, one thing I would say to any teacher listening to this today is, you, you know, you can agree or disagree with me as much as you want, that's fine. But if you believe today in 2018, or this is August, end, of, end of August 2018? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or is, I'm asking, I don't know if it's September yet. No, it's 31st of August. 31st of August today. today. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say if, if, if you believe today that um, the dominant classroom model in five years' time is going to be a one pace fits all classroom where the transmission of information comes from a teacher at the front of the classroom, say on a PowerPoint or some other kind of presentation, you are sorely mistaken. That mm. that is going to be the case, uh, and I encourage every edu every educator, whether for your own peace of mind, your own professional development, whether from the perspective of you maintaining the skills that are going to be necessary, we have to start switching our minds to developing teachers in a way um, which is upskilling them in what a teacher is going to be imminently in classrooms, and that teacher is imminently going to be someone who guides learners, facilitates, inspires, listens, talks to, target sets, finds brilliant resources and opportunities, is a magnificent reader and marker and feedbacker of mm -hmm. things like written work, for example. Those are the behaviors that we're going to find in our true master teachers over the coming years. And I urge every educator to realize that now, because if we sit on the behaviors of... Uh, 
get the line the kids up get them in doing a starter now a, now a presentation now a worksheet here's an exam question now obviously i'm, I'm being a bit cliche here but uh, and then a plenary and if we sit on that behavior and we assume that let's call that roughly average behavior today i know a lot of people won't be doing that but let's call that roughly average behavior today if we accept today that that's going to be the case in five years time we are going to have one hell of a shock and teachers out there going to find themselves in a situation where they're going to think, I wish I'd known this sooner. So I urge people to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess for me, I'd like to influence that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. sorry, sorry, oh. I mean, one other thing. But I want to remain fiercely independent. So I, I think as an example of that, if I mean, the DFE rang us today, I mean, or exam board X Y Z, and they wanted to do whatever project with us. I mean, I would seriously resist that depending on the conditions because we have to be independent. We have to, our user is the student and we have to serve the student. Mm -hmm. And so a, a fierce desire for independence in our uh, work as well will also be, or or uh, a, 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 a drive for impartiality, ongoing impartiality is going to, I think, be really, really important. Mm, great. great, James, this has been... Great. We're going to have to wrap it up here because otherwise, mm -hmm. I mean, we could go on for hours. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll we'll wrap it up here. All I want to say is thank you very much, and uh, wish you luck for the coming year and the, for the years to come. That's great. Thank you. Thank I really you enjoyed it. Much. Nice to be on this side. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. I've improved by a whole grade. I've improved. 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 Improved by a whole grade. By a whole grade. By a whole grade. My teacher isn't just Mr. Maddock, it's a whole teaching team made up of James, Mike and Marta. My classroom's all about doing and applying. My day standing at the front of the classroom with a PowerPoint are long gone. I master every concept by learning at my own pace. I spend 100% of my class time interacting and supporting individual students. I move on only when the moment is right for me, not the whole class. I know what each and every student is mastering and struggling on at every moment. I know exactly what I need to learn next, and I can go back and review material at any time. I spend my teaching time supporting and inspiring, not planning, delivering and marking. I can learn from anywhere at any time. I can switch off when school closes, knowing they are learning from the best. My teacher has my homework marked before I get to class. I set every piece of homework at the start of the year. I'm two weeks ahead of my expected progress. I can track everyone's progress with a swipe of a finger. I can track my own progress and set my own targets. I now have time to focus on developing the skills of every learner in my classroom. I know exactly what it means to explain, evaluate and analyse and I'm not afraid of any exam. My lessons are now far more about the skills and the application, not just the content itself. I've completely remodelled what it means to be a teacher in my classroom.